With the world's attention turned to other major crises, the war in Sudan seems to have fallen off the radar. In 2019, we saw social media turn hashtag blue for Sudan as thousands expressed solidarity with a youth-led revolution there. Now in the face of a new wave of violence in the country, where have all the hashtags and support gone? I'm Annelise Borges and this is The Stream. What is going on in Sudan right now? Unfortunately, there isn't that much media coverage on it. You won't see much about what's happening in Sudan, as I mentioned. It's day 198 of the war in Sudan, and I'm here to give you a quick and dirty of what's been going on. Hi, it's day 245 of the war in Sudan, and I'm here to give you a quick and dirty of what's been going on. Rohan and Hemeti, it's the battle between evil and evil. Killing, bombing, raping, looting. I am sick and tired of our suffering falling into deaf ears. So now me and you need to keep our eyes on Sudan. We need the world to stand by us. We need the world to speak about Sudan and never shut up. Since April last year, a fight between the army and the paramilitary rapid support forces has ravaged Sudan. Yet the country has all but vanished from headlines in the hope of raising awareness about the situation for those still stuck there and those who have fled. Sudanese youth continue organizing on and offline. With me to discuss this today are some of those trying to fight to keep all eyes on Sudan. Afnan Hassab, a doctor who was able to flee during the early days of the war. Yasmin Abdel Majid, an author and activist. And a political analyst Hulud Khair, who founded Confluence Advisory, a think and do tank based in Khartoum. Thank you all so much for joining us today. But before we go in depth into this conversation, let's take a look at the numbers of Sudan's humanitarian crisis. The UN says more than 7 million people have been displaced since the war began. 24 million are in need of humanitarian assistance, which amounts to half of Sudan's population. Almost 18 million people are facing acute hunger and 19 million children are not attending school. Afnan, I would like to start by asking you about your personal experience with this war. Can you share what happened when the war started and when did you understand that it was a serious situation that you could maybe have to leave your home and your country? Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, the war Saturday was a regular day for me, a day of elective surgeries. And... Um, that morning, I left my house, I went to work, and I passed by the RSA. And because I've been in Sudan for quite some time, for the last five years at least, we were used to seeing them everywhere. Um, so I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think that this is going to be any different than what we're used to seeing. And 10 minutes after I passed by them um, near the sports city, where the fighting uh, started, um, 10 minutes after my friend and I heard very loud noise and we thought that a tire must have blown or something of such sort. We did not think this was real. Um, I started my day of elective surgeries normally and suddenly my phone started ringing. Everyone in the OR was panicking. Um, people were trying to leave the operating room, panicking, trying to find their family. And that's when I knew that something really terrible must have happened. And as these people were so used to political unrest, mm -hmm. we really did not think that this, this is going to be something of such magnitude. And from that point onwards, I am one of many who was stuck inside the hospital for days, unable to go anywhere. Um, and I was one of a small number of doctors who were able to make it that morning. And the rest of the hospital was, all the patients in the hospital had no one to tend to them. So it became our responsibility to take care of whoever was, for, to take care of all the inpatients at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I worked at the neurosurgical department and there were patients in the obstetrics department, pediatrics, internal medicine, patients I did not even know um, who were their doctors to begin with. And it became our responsibility to take care of all these people who were now unable to leave and have no one to really take care of them. Mm, that sounds absolutely terrifying and heartbreaking. Um, 
we're going to get more into how you managed to get out of, of Sudan a little later. But uh, Hulud, if I can um, turn to you now. Five years ago, the Sudanese youth attracted a lot of attention during their revolution. But the current war has received little to no media coverage. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, oftentimes we hear that the issue is that there are other sort of global priorities, including Ukraine and since October, uh, what's happening in Gaza. But that's not really very convincing because oh. Sudan has had a lot of sort of media attention and, of course, commensurate to that policy attention previously when, for example, the Iraq war um, was waging and when the invasion of, of, of Afghanistan was happening as well and during the global war on terror, which attracted a lot of media and policy attention. So, you know, there have been times in the past where Sudan has been able to um, get that level of attention and that hasn't, um, we haven't seen that this time round. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that it's quite obvious that, you know, the sort of 15 minute news cycle mm -hmm. um, that we're all very familiar with has now probably become a five minute news cycle. And because you're not able to get as much coverage from the ground outside of ordinary citizens, you know, not able to get the big news networks really in country for a sustained period of time, that has hampered the appetite within news uh, media houses to sort of, you know, devote attention to this. But I think the fact that people on the ground are continuing to get the message out there on social media, take videos, you know, and, and give their own testimonies should grant Sudan a lot more media attention um, than it's having. And then, of course, we live in, in a sort of a global moment where displacement actually um, receives a very callous response from the international community. You know, we've seen it in Europe, we've seen it in North America, We've seen it in other parts of the world where displaced people are not getting the kind of uh, support they should be getting, whether that's in sort of humanitarian aid or whether that's in media attention in order to tell their stories. And a lot of that is influenced by global structures of um, system, system, systemic racism, mm -hmm. which means that, for example, it's not just Sudan that is not receiving um, attention for the conflicts that is happening there. You know, Congo, Angola, Burundi, mm -hmm. ten, the, you know, 10 mm -hmm. at least African countries that are not receiving any attention mm -hmm. um, from international media. You, you mentioned a very uh, a few very interesting points. We're, we're going to get to uh, more on the perception of um, unrest and conflict in Africa. But, Yasmin, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think so many of the points that Khulud made are incredibly relevant and mm -hmm. kind of heartbreaking, actually, as a Absolutely. Sudanese person and as somebody who, you know, has, as so many of us have, was so engaged and so hopeful in 2018-19, I think there is a real sense of, of tragedy about, you know, the... The well, hopefully not the conclusion, but the, this particular outcome. And I also think that part of this is about the narrative. You know, there is a narrative that this is between two generals, but it's also should be a narrative about you know the the revolution trying to be thwarted and the and the elite in a particular society or the leadership of a particular society being supported by by regional and international powers uh, oppressing its civilian population. However, I think some of these narratives, because they don't fit into an easy, you know, evil versus good narrative, mm -hmm. they are sometimes seen as more difficult to communicate to international audiences, regardless of whether or not that's true. But I do feel and engaging with people on social media and, and engaging with media organizations, sometimes people are like, well, this is just in the too hard basket. We don't know how to engage in it. And again, this may or may not actually be true, but that is the, there is that perception around it. And mm. it feeds into all sorts of other stereotypes about you know, what happens on the African continent. Mm. Oh, isn't this just the status quo, which is just not true. Mm. But unfortunately, people can easily slip into that. Mm. Very interesting point indeed. And again, we're going to explore that a little bit more later. But Afnan, I would like to turn to your personal story once again. Can you tell us a little bit more about your physical journey out of the country? Yes, um, I can. And before I start talking about my journey, I just want to say that I am one of the privileged people to have had the means and the support from friends and family outside to get out. Um, the process of leaving within Khartoum itself took three to four stages of trying to move from one 
Eventually, we had to leave the hospital because it was unsafe for us to stay there. And as usual, doctors are targeted. Um, some of my friends were actually held at gunpoint uh, while they're trying to reach us um, inside an ambulance. So this is just to give you one example of how um, healthcare providers are targeted. Um, I had to move from the hospital to a neighbor, like a neighborhood that's close by. It's called the Mujahideen, but it was the safest place at the time. And then from there, move on to Jabra, move on to a place called the Nusra, and so forth. So I can, and in this long process, it was a process of trying to also get my documents and my passport to leave. Um, eventually, I was able to find a bus. Um, I was by myself. And there were strangers who were kind enough on social media itself who reached out and told me that there was a seat in one of the buses that I found that I was able to take. Um, there's a lot, uh, there are many details in the middle that I will not mention about how expensive these buses were, how um, people got scammed, people paid a lot of money, and these buses never even showed up. Um, I was one of the lucky ones who found a bus that actually did show up. Um, the process of leaving from from inside Khartoum to outside and reaching eventually Dongola, Halfa, and then Egypt was a very terrifying process. Um, I personally did not want to. I, I was I was trying so hard to not see any dead bodies because I knew there were dead bodies everywhere. But anyone who was or is in Khartoum will tell you that the city smells like dead bodies decomposing everywhere. Mm. Um, there was the fear of seeing something you don't want to see. There was the fear of being stopped, of being killed. Of, I mean, we, I was reading stories of people getting killed by mistake. And, and that's the case for a lot of us. We are collateral damage in this war. And throughout this process, as a young woman by myself, I have slept in so many houses. Um, I was hosted by strangers and um, found familiarity with strangers that I don't know, but in that moment they became family and the only safe thing I have. I'm so, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It, it sounds absolutely dreadful, dreadful and like an endless journey. And as you mentioned, um, you're part of the lucky ones. You made it out. Uh, you made it out alive. Um, I, I, I want to bring the other guests into this conversation because um but with a point that you made on twitter um you tweeted something about the number of followers that you got on uh, x um being amplified because of your tweets about palestine um this is what you said you said i'm not a palestinian i'm sudanese i care deeply for both ceasefire in gaza and sudan keep eyes on sudan there is enough empathy for all amplify our voices and speak for all. Yasmin, um, you are also very active on social media. Do you agree that social media right now has a very important role to play? I think for the Sudanese diaspora especially, and also for people that were on the ground who had access to social media, it has been like the only place in many cases where they were able to access information, reliable information. Afnan even just talked about how finding a route out was facilitated by social media. And, you know, I, I like many other people in the diaspora, um, make posts about what's going on in Sudan. And quite often people will say to me that my social media posts are the only reason they know about a conflict happening in Sudan, which is, you know, I'm not a media organization. It is, it's, it's far from ideal, but it does play, you know, for better or for worse, it plays a vital role in communicating information from the ground. Part of it also is about archiving some information. You know, I work with folks collecting some of this information and archiving it because, you know, people post videos, they post photos, and then it kind of disappears into the ether. But this is all kind of evidence. It paints a picture of what's going on on the ground. Mm -hmm. I know many journalists rely on call outs, but I think it's really, I, I have a complicated relationship with social media personally, but when it comes to Sudan specifically, when it comes to the power of a hashtag like keep eyes on Sudan, I, I feel like it is unrivaled mm. um, for its ability to have to have an impact. Again, whether but for better or for worse, because ultimately we are not in control of these platforms. Mm -hmm. We don't actually, we are relying on 
you know, we're relying on other people's eyeballs. We're relying on corporations that absolutely. may have on a supposed to democratic platform. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, while researching exactly. for this particular show, we came across a few uh, very interesting points uh, that you guys have already actually mentioned. A significant number of online comments about this one important aspect of the conversation. Take a look. How many more lives would it take for the world to step in, for people to care? I'm sick and tired of the dehumanization of African lives. I am sick and tired of our suffering falling into deaf ears. We're also people. We're just like everyone else. We're not just statistics. We're humans with hopes, dreams, and aspirations like the rest of you. Hulud, you mentioned this before. Do you think that the general public is desensitized from war and conflict when it happens in African countries? I think more so than than when it happens in other parts of the world. But if, um, as, as you pointed out, and as Yasmin has said as well, um, that it takes everyday citizens in, within these war zones who are going through unspeakable horrors, to raise the alarm about what's happening because of the dearth of media attention. And at the same time, you have some of these contexts where you don't have a great proportion of um, internet penetration and where you don't have a lot of people who have smartphones, then you are left with the really unfortunate reality that we have to basically make our own stories and get our own stories out there, but we face many uh, impediments to be able to do so. Not everyone has a smartphone and can sort of, you know, catalog their journey for people to know about it. Not many people can engage with journalists at the global level, um, particularly if, if language is a barrier. Not everyone is in, the, in, a, in sort of a mind frame to do so. And I think to put effectively the burden is being placed on the very people that are undergoing these horrors to um, raise the alarm, effectively to do the job of international um, media and, and, and publications and houses. And that's frankly just a really unfair uh, burden to place on people that are already going through um, such such a terrible time and, you know, who knows for how, how long for. I think that the indignity of having to prove that um, the lives of, of your countrymen um, matter just as much as everyone else's, I think is, is actually something that people in this situation could do without. Absolutely. Um, I would like to thank Afnan for joining us here in the conversation today. We really appreciate you sharing so much of your journey um, today with us. And I would like now to invite Ajuj Kuka to join us on the stream. He's the external communications officer for the Khartoum State Emergency Response Room. Uh, Ajuj, can you briefly explain what the emergency response room um, actually is and the type of work that you do? Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. So the emergency response room is this grassroots um, group of people who came together. Uh, it actually came from the revolution. It was really born from the revolution. In the revolution, uh, in the end, we started having organizing on the neighborhood uh, level. The universities were shut down. You couldn't move, whatever. So uh, the way people uh, managed to organize and go out to protest, the protest that actually toppled Omar al-Bashir was by working in these neighborhoods. Uh, when the coup happened, People use the same method and they're protesting and it was really uh, made sure that the uh, uh, the military, the two generals were not able to create a government. So when the when the war started, of course, it was really loud and nobody can hear us anymore. You can't go out to protest. Uh, being a civilian, just just you don't have a voice anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks into it, uh, we started facing things like not having enough food, uh, not having cooking gas. Uh, having problems with uh, hospitals and whatnot. And we started organizing what we called emergency response room. And this is something that we tried before during the time of COVID when people couldn't move in different neighborhoods. So we started, we came together and we started slowly. Uh, in some places it was, we went to hospitals, we were trying to help with the logistics. Uh, we were, all our work was based on mutual aid. So people brought what they had. Um, uh, when gas was, there was no more cooking gas, people needed to cook together. So they, they went to the schools, to any public space, uh, and they started like bringing their uh, resources together, uh, getting charcoals. I mean, this is a city, so a lot of them, people couldn't really work, uh, cook with charcoals in their homes. Mm -hmm. So they started going to these schools and they started cooking together. Uh, as time passed and uh, 
money became a problem. People are not working. This is nine months into it. Um, the amount of aid was less. So people started eating only in these uh, schools. Uh, some people started planting also. And it got so to the point that people only There is an aspect that is very local. Day. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. This is, this is really localized help being organized because you've been very vocal about how uh, these local groups have basically replaced international aid organizations who were all trying to get their workers out of Sudan. So the beauty of it, we did not replace them. We're actually collaborating and working with them. Mm -hmm. The idea of mutual aid is a really old idea. It's, it's been 10 years on uh, people talked about it. This is the way humanitarian aid needs to be revolutionized. And yes, our revolution from the, from the perspective of in the street has stopped, but we are actually revolutionizing what does it mean to be humanitarian, what humanitarian aid means. So from day one, uh, a lot of the uh, aid workers were running away. And while they were running away, we were actually on the ground trying to figure it out. Sudanese people were helping each other. Mm -hmm. We got money that came from the diaspora. And basically, we started the humanitarian aid with, with our own money, our own resources. And we kept doing it up to today. Up to today, most of the money comes from outside. But we managed to talk to the UN, to a lot of the big uh, uh, international organizations, to the local NGOs, who most of them, they had fled because uh, they're privileged enough to leave. Uh, but people stayed at and are working. And right now, um, like I'm an external communication officer. I'm, I was caught outside when the war started. We have a lot of people in the diaspora who are helping with writing reports. We're actually have to actually t work with the standard of international NGOs. So mm -hmm. we need everybody. So this is this is a case where solidarity really matters. Yes, Mimi, you really want uh, to weigh in there. I, I want you to be brief because I've got uh, one more question to you before, but, but go ahead. Sure. I just wanted to add and to emphasize how important the role of the emergency response rooms and the resistance committees is. And, and also, you know, a, a journalist at the end of last year at the Mail and Guardian said that we really should be nominating these movements for like the Nobel Peace Prize, because uh -huh. what they've actually done. And when we when we think about, you know, the stories that we should be telling about Sudan, it's actually these stories, not the stories of the generals, but the stories of incredible mutual aid movements, incredible local organizing, and, and a demonstration to the world of mm -hmm. what is actually possible when it feels like there's so little. So I just I just wanted to like celebrate that because I feel like there's very little that we sometimes celebrate. Absolutely. Uh, Hulud, I want to get you um, to, to basically give us a conclusion here uh, in this show, if that's possible. Um, as we said, there is very little information coming out of Sudan right now, uh, at least not nearly enough. There isn't enough attention being paid to this crisis. And Sudan has the largest child displacement crisis in the world. Most children there out, are out of school. Uh, what does the future hold for these children, for your country? Well, I think, you know, the first thing to say is that you're absolutely right. The conflict in Sudan is not like any other conflict in the world. Not only are the displacement numbers, the numbers of children out of school, the proportion of health facilities far beyond what we see in other conflicts. The war in Sudan is the only conflict in the world right now where it is the capital city that was hit first. And therefore, the, this entire state is collapsing as we speak. And that means that really, the, you know, the, the world, whether it's media houses, whether it's policymakers, decision makers, etc., they really need to, you know, focus and invest as much as possible in stemming the tide of this war, not just for Sudan's sake, but for the region. And in terms of the future for, of Sudan, you know, I'm obviously concerned that this war, um, like many wars in Sudan's history, can last decades. Mm. But at the same time, it's precisely because of the work of emergency response rooms and other grassroots ac activists and, and activities that I see that actually we have a lot of hope left. And there are actually the building blocks of this kind of Sudan that we want to see are being built as we speak. They're not being built by, um, you know, big, large corporations and not built, being built by NGOs and not being built even by the government, whatever is left of it. They're being built by ordinary citizens in communities helping each other out. And that is exactly the kind of activity, activity that weaves back the social fabric that has been ripped apart in Sudan since April. Mm. On this note, one of hope, we are ending the show today. Thank you so much, Holud, Yasmin, and Ajuj, for joining us here on the stream for this very important conversation. And thank you all, of course, for tuning in. Don't forget to keep this conversation going 
online. And if you have a topic that you'd like to see featured here, you can use the hashtag or the handle AJStream and we'll look into it. Take care and I'll see you soon.